All right, so we're going to be looking at the somatic nervous system in this chapter, and we're going to kind of see how everything that we've talked about with the brain, the spinal cord, the spinal nerves, the cranial nerves, and all that stuff and how it comes together here in the somatic nervous system. Here, we're also going to talk about the different senses, the general sensations, as well as the special senses. So guys, there's different levels of sensation that we want to talk about. For one, we need to know what a sensation means. Sensation is a conscious or subconscious awareness of either an external stimuli, so something outside of the world, like what you see, hear, if something touches you, um, or an internal stimulus, so like your blood sugar changing or your blood pressure changing, your calcium levels, that kind of thing. Okay, so it's going to detect a, some sort of kind of change. So your awareness or interpretation of that change or that stimulus is what we call your perception. Perception will be different from e for each individual. Now, when we talk about sensations, each sensation has what we call a modality. A modality is the uniqueness of each sensation. So it's how you can distinguish between one type of sensation from another. So how you distinguish tickle from an itch, light pressure from deep pressure, vibration from touch, it's your way of being able to distinguish each of those modalities. Now, each sensory neuron that you have carries only one modality or one type of message. Okay, so they're specialized in the fact that they only carry one type. So when we look at this, guys, you have temperature receptors and some of them are cold receptors. They only detect cold. Others are warm receptors. They only detect warm or hot. You have pain receptors, but these pain receptors detect different types of pain, sharp pain, throbbing, things like that. We also see pressure, touch, proprioception, hearing, vision, smell, and so on. So each of these is going to have one type of information that it carries. Now, these sensations can be broken down into two main categories. Your general senses. General senses are going to be both somatic, so talking about like the skin, or visceral, meaning your internal organs. When we talk about these somatic general senses, these are things like tactile touch, thermal pain, and proprioception. The visceral or internal organs will also have things like pressure, stretch, chemical composition, like detecting chemical changes, nausea, whether you're hungry or not, like hunger, and temperature. The other main category are the special senses. The special senses get their name because they are very specific and they are located in one distinct area in your body. The general sensations are throughout your whole body. The special senses are in one particular area. Things like smell, only found here in your nose. Taste, only your tongue. Hearing, only your ears. Vision, only your eyes. And so those are considered those special senses. So let's look at what a sensory modality looks like. Remember we talk about that it carries one type of information and this information is going to go from the sensation where it was detected to your central nervous system, your brain and spinal cord, and then you're going to, based on how you perceived it, respond by sending a message back out through your motor neurons. So if we look here, we see the sensory neuron collects the information. The sensory neuron is called a receptor and it sends the signal towards your central nervous system shown here in yellow. This is known as an interneuron. It is part of the central nervous system, spinal cord or brain, and it's going to help you perceive and figure out what you're going to do with that information. Once you have a action in mind, the information is going to go down the motor neuron shown here in blue. The motor neuron is going to talk mostly to like skeletal muscle, cause a movement to happen. If it's part of that autonomic nervous system or subconscious, it might also talk to a gland telling you to secrete something like saliva or tears or something like that. It may also talk to cardiac muscle or smooth muscle, but some sort of effect is going to happen because of that motor neuron. Now guys, these sensory neurons can be very different based on what they are detecting. Because remember, they only detect one thing. And structure is always related to function. So when we look here, we have an example here where we see a sensory neuron. It is a unipolar neuron, meaning remember it has only one connection to the cell body. And in this particular case, we have free nerve endings, free dendrites that are collecting information, and it's going to travel down the axon. On the other hand, the second one is still going to be what we would look at as a unipolar neuron, 
but we see that it has a different kind of look at its dendrites. These dendrites are encapsulated, so they're like the capsule. So this one would be more for like pressure. So whenever pressure gets pushed on it, like if you were sitting on a ball and it squishes the ball, that's what sends a signal down the axon. The last one's part of the special senses. Remember, special senses are going to be very unique in their structure. This is also mean they're going to be a little more specialized in the way that they detect the sensation and send it. And so this particular case is a specialized cell receptor in your eye called the rod. And the rod collects information and then it goes to what we call that bipolar neuron cell in the retina of the eye. So the structure is very different, but remember, structure is related to function. So let's talk a little bit about these receptors that we see. Sensory receptors can be grouped into several classes, and these classes are based on their structural and functional characteristics. So if we look structurally first, we see that they have microscopic structures present. These might be free nerve endings, okay, where we saw those dendrites were just out and free, or they might be encapsulated where they were wrapped around. Okay, so when we look at the free dendrites or bare dendrites, they lack a structural specialization, and this is seen in some sensations like pain receptors, temperature receptors, tickle, itch, and touch. On the other hand, those encapsulated types of dendrites where they have a capsule around them, they are enclosed in a connective tissue. They're going to detect things like pressure, vibration, and different types of touch. Another thing we can look at structurally is their location. Wherever the location of the receptor is could give us information about its stimuli. So when we look here, we have exterior receptors. Those are on the outside. They're going to be where they're detecting outside stimulus. Interoceptors are inside. Those are going to be more of your visceral organs. So sometimes they're also called viscerosceptors. The type of stimulus they detect also will help give us information. This is going to be more of the functional side. What do they detect? Do they detect pain? Those are called nociceptors. Do they detect pressure or actual mechanical change? Those are going to be called mechanoreceptors. So we can also figure out what they kind of detect based on their name as well. Now, these sensory receptors, guys, are very selective. Each re sensory receptor responds strongly to only one kind of stimuli. That's it. Okay, so if it's a cold receptor, it's only going to respond to a cold stimuli. Same receptors may respond weakly or not at all to another stimuli. So even if it's warm, they may detect it a little bit, but they don't respond to it. Now, simple receptors are what we see in our general senses, okay? So the general somatic senses like touch, itch, tickle, pressure, vibration, temperature, pain, proprioceptors, all those kind of general sensations that are located throughout the body are going to have what we call simple receptors. The complex receptors are going to be found with your special organs, and this is because they detect a specialized type of sensation, like smell, taste, vision, hearing, and equilibrium. So they're going to be very localized, and they're going to be very complex in their structure. Most sensory receptors, though, they are adaptable, meaning they change in their sensitivity during t over the time that the stimulus is present. Now, example of this, let's say you run a hot bath, okay? You get into the bath. At first, it's really hot. That's kind of like where you have to put like one foot in and you have to let it get used to it and then the next foot in and get used to it and so on. What's happening there is when you get used to it, that's where that receptor is becoming less sensitive to it. And a lot of times after a while, you're going to actually feel like the bath is getting cold. However, if somebody else who has not been in that water comes and touches it, they're going to feel like it's very warm still but your sensations have gotten used to it. Now, some receptors can adapt more quickly than others, like smell adapts really fast, and this is a good thing. Let's think about it. If you're driving down the ro road and you're the one who hits a skunk or you drive by where a skunk has been hit, you smell that strong at first, but then eventually it goes away. It doesn't really go away. You just got used to it because if you go pick somebody up and they get in the car, they're like, man, did you hit a skunk? They're going to smell it where you didn't anymore. Same thing like in your house when you turn on a scentsy or a candle. You're going to have that smell that you smell it very strongly at first, but then you get used to it. If you leave the room and come back in, you may smell it again. Okay, and so that's what we're talking about with it becoming um, adaptable.
okay, through that process. Touch is another one that adapts very quickly. Think about it. If you put your clothes on, you feel them touching you at first, but then you forget. Now you're remembering though, because I just said it. You're actually feeling it again because I said it. The thing is, you, it's adaptable. You don't really notice it much anymore. Now, some of these receptors adapt more slowly, meaning they remain sensitive for a lot longer period of time. Now, these are going to be ones that are really important for homeostasis, like your proprioceptors, knowing where your arms, your legs, your muscles, what they're doing. Those are important. We want them to constantly be detecting that. Uh, blood glucose levels. We don't want you to get used to that because that's what causes lots of dangers and problems in people who have uncontrolled diabetes. Same thing with like uncontrolled blood pressure. Um, pain's another one. You're like, man, I wish pain would adapt quickly. No, pain is one of those things that tells your body that something is wrong. So we don't want it to adapt too quickly. So guys, this little chart here just shows you a comparison between general sensations and special sensations or senses. General senses include the somatic sensations like tactile, thermal, pain, and proprioception, as well as visceral sensations, your internal organs. They're scattered throughout the body and they're relatively simple in their structure. Whereas special senses include smell, taste, vision, hearing, and equilibrium, and they're all located right here in your head, which means they're going to use mostly cranial nerves to travel. They're going to have anatomically distinct structures, meaning that the retina of the eye looks totally different than the cochlea of the ear and that kind of thing. So there's very distinct structures that are going to make them that special sense and this makes them more complex and they're more complex in their neural pathway and how the sensation gets from being detected to the brain and how it's perceived. Now when we look at this guys receptors are named according to their location and these can have three different names that we're looking at here. So the first one is what we call the exteroceptors. These are located near the surface of the body. They detect changes in the external environment like touch, temperature, vision, smell, taste, pain, all that kind of stuff. These are normally the ones we think of when we think about senses. Okay, when we think about, oh, our five senses, that's what we're mostly thinking about. However, we also have interoceptors. Those are also known as visoreceptors. Viso They're located inside like your blood vessels, inside your internal organs. They detect changes in the internal environment like blood pressure changes, chemical changes like your glucose, calcium, sodium, potassium. They may even detect stretch like your bladder when it stretches when it's full and your stomach when it stretches when it's full. Those are all called interoceptors. Now, most of the time, those are going to be unconsciously perceived. You're not really feeling them unless they're due to pressure or pain. We also have proprioceptors. Proprioceptors are located in your muscles, your tendons, your joints, even into your internal ear. And they're going to detect, they are going to detect changes in your body position. Okay, so changes that happen. Now, these can be fooled. Proprioceptors can be fooled like when you're sleeping and you have a dream that you're falling and you actually will jerk yourself awake because your body thinks that it's falling, those proprioceptors in your muscles, your tendons, your joints actually sent signals the brain thought that they were falling when in reality you were just laying in bed. Okay, so these could be fooled at some points when, you're, when your dreams are so vivid. But for the most part, these are going to let your body know, your brain know what your body is doing, including your muscle tension at any given time whether you're sitting in a chair, standing up, laying down, that sort of thing. Now, receptors can also get named based on their mode of activation. So if guys, if you'll notice on these last two kind of slides, there was a word list and there's like matching, guarantee there'll be test questions over this, okay? So when we look at this, mechanoreceptors are going to detect stretching or mechanical pressure, things like touch, pressure, proprioception, vibration, hearing, equilibrium, and even blood pressure are going to use what we call mechanoreceptors. Thermoreceptors detect changes in temperature, okay? So thermo, that tells you, has to do with temperature. Nociceptors are going to give painful stimuli sensations, tissue damage. And guys, when this happens, we say that it's a noxious stimulus. And so that's where the nociception comes from. Photoreceptors are going to be activated by photons of light. These are only located inside the retina of your eye. They are detecting the light and they are the only found there. 
Chemo receptors are going to detect changes in chemicals, things like in your mouth for taste, your nose for smell, or in your body fluids, like for blood glucose levels, calcium levels, sodium, potassium, that kind of thing. Those chemicals are going to be detected in your blood and your body fluids. The next one are the osmo receptors, and these detect your osmotic pressure of your body fluids, and they're going to help your brain determine if you're dehydrated or not. This is going to help determine if your kidneys need to hold on to water or let it go in the urine, because this is going to be looking at your water levels. All right, so let's talk real quick about the somato sensation or general senses. Your general touch sensations, this is going to be receptors located in your skin, your subcutaneous letter, layer, so just below the skin, okay, that's a connective tissue, your mucous membranes, like the lining of any natural opening in your body, and both ends of your GI tract, your mouth and your anus. Now, these are going to contain receptors for touch, tickle, itch, pressure, vibrations, thermal changes, pain. Some body tissues contain more cutaneous receptors than others. So, Remember when we talked about the homunculus back in the brain chapter, that little man that looked kind of odd across the brain? If there's more receptors present, there's a higher density, like a city versus country living. If they're more tightly packed together, you're going to be able to distinguish sensations and locations a lot better than if they're spread out. So places that have a really high density of these receptors are like your tongue, your fingertips, and your lips. And think about it, little kids, babies, toddlers, how do they explore the world? With their hands and their mouth. Because those are the areas that have the most receptors. They're the most sensitive. Okay, especially compared to like your leg or your forearm, those aren't going to have as many. Okay, so the density is how spread out they are, or how closely packed they are together. Now, how do these sensations go to the brain? So there's a pathway here and it goes from the cutaneous receptor. The receptor receives the information, let's say for hot. You realize that that's hot. It's the sensation picks it up. The receptor picks it up. It sends a nerve impulse to what we call the somatic efferent neuron. This is going to go towards the central nervous system. It then goes either to the spinal cord, okay, in the, the idea of a spinal nerve, or if it's in the head, it's going to travel through a cranial nerve. This nerve is going to travel through the spinal cord or brain stem to the thalamus. Now, remember, the thalamus is the relay station. It's going to send the information where it needs to go, and it's going to send it to the appropriate somatosensory area of that parietal lobe of the brain. This is going to be where it detects that perception, that cerebral cortex. This is where you realize, oh, that's hot, and that's touching my left hand. Okay, so we say, oh, that's why I don't want to touch anymore. I'm going to pull that back because it's hot and it's my left hand. Okay, on the other hand, if you were to step on a Lego, let's just say you stepped on it with your right foot. This is going to send that information up says, ow, that hurts. It's sharp. And that was my right foot. Okay, so it's going to send that information to that part of the cerebral cortex. Now, guys, these tactile sensations, these touch sensations are due to tactile receptors that are found in the upper layers of your skin. Most of these are mechanoreceptors. And this picture should look familiar because this was back from the skin chapter in Anatomy 1, where you have the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous layer. And there's multiple types of neurons spread out here. You'll notice that some of them are very close to the surface. Those are going to be for more for like light touch, uh, very light pressure, whereas the deeper ones are going to be for deeper touch, um, stretching of the skin, um, that kind of thing. So they're kind of spread out through there. And this is just showing you that there's a lot of different types of receptors present. You can even see their structures are different. We have some free nerve endings up in here, and we then have some of the encapsulated located here. All right, before we move on to some of the special senses, I want to talk to you a little bit about pain sensations. With pain sensations, guys, these are a vital sensation. Like you don't want to live without this because it's your danger alert signal to your body that if you don't stop that or if it doesn't get taken care of, extreme damage and even possible irreversible damage may occur to your body. These are known as nociceptors. Nociceptors are the pain receptors. They do contain free nerve endings. They're located in nearly every tissue of your body. So that way you can detect pain no matter where it's located. 
when a tissue gets damaged, it actually releases chemicals. These chemicals are going to stimulate the nociceptors that send the signal for pain. Nociceptors have little to no adaptation, so they remain sensitive for a very long period of time. Now, there are different types of pain, and I gave you kind of like a this versus this on a lot of these. So we have acute pain. Acute pain is short-lived, but it's normally very sharp pain. Have you ever gotten that like pain in your side that was real sharp, like it even took your breath away, and you're like, <gasps> okay, if I move, is that going to come back? But it didn't. That's more of an acute pain. Chronic pain is more like a toothache, okay, where it starts off where it's manageable and you're like, oh, that hurts a little bit, but it's not too bad. But then it builds and it gets worse and worse and worse. That's what we're looking at more for chronic. There's also superficial pain versus deep pain. Superficial pain is like on the surface, more of like your skin. Deep pain is going to be your internal organs. Okay, so we have the difference there. We also see that we have visceral pain. That would be specifically like an organ, like the kidney itself, the appendix, the gallbladder. Referred pain deals with the fact that we have those dermatomes where those nerves kind of service an area of the body. And so because of this, embryologically, when you were developing, they all service one area. And so sometimes the connections can get crossed. And so like when somebody's having a heart attack, some of the main features of pain is they'll have chest pain, which makes sense because the heart's right here. But they'll also have pain that runs down their left arm specifically towards their pinky. Okay, that's referred pain. That's where that neuron is sitting and saying, hey, there's pain down in my arm when it really isn't, it's your heart. This picture shows you a lot of different areas of referred pain and a lot of them make sense. Like the kidneys, it's that high part of the back, but it can travel down the legs. The bladder is located right there in the pelvic region where you have that pain. But some don't make a lot of sense. Like if you look at the lung and diaphragm is pain in the neck area, whereas the liver and gallbladder is on the other side of the neck area. So it's kind of odd sometimes where this referred pain is located. But it could give us an indication that it's a visceral issue, deeper issue, and the pain is just manifesting in those areas. Another thing we can see is phantom pain. Phantom pain is going to be where they've had an amputation. They are missing that limb. Okay, now let's just say if I had my hand amputated, okay, are those nerves that serviced my fingers gone? No, this part's gone, but they still travel all the way down to this point. So if they get irritated at this area, they'll send a sensation to my brain and it'll say, hey, my thumb hurts, but I don't have a thumb. Okay, it's gone, but that nerve is sending a signal. Phantom pain is hard to treat because you don't want to just dope them up on medication to stop the pain. And so a lot of times what we have to do is use like what we call optical illusions. We've got to trick the brain into realizing it's either not there or that we took care of it. And one way we can do this is through mirrors. Okay, so like just say if we had my hand, I can put this hand out with a mirror and it looks like it's my other hand, right? Because a mirror does the opposite. I can then say if I had an itch on this hand, I could itch this one, scratch it, and then maybe it will help this one. It'll trick my brain. If I'm watching them scratch this hand in the mirror, it'll think, oh, I'm doing that. If you're a Grey's Anatomy fan, they had where Arizona, she loses one of her legs in an accident, but she has a lot of phantom pain. And at one point when she's doing her surgery in the OR, she's having so much pain in her foot, but she doesn't have a foot. So she tells the nurse, I want you to stab my foot with the scalpel. Well, she doesn't have one. It's a prosthetic. So she stabs it and then her brain looks at it and is like, hey, that didn't hurt like it was supposed to. Well, that's because I don't have a foot. So it makes the brain reset in a sense. Okay. And so phantom pain sometimes can be very difficult to treat. Now, when we are in pain, there are some different ways we want to treat this pain. Okay. One of them is through anesthesia. Anesthesia is going to block the sensations of pain, but we can also block the sensation of touch and pressure. It doesn't allow the message to reach the brain. Now, you can go under general anesthetic. That's what they do when you have mostly surgeries. It removes all sensations. It causes you to be unconscious. Okay. So you don't feel any of it that's going on. However, they could do a spinal anesthesia. This is what they do when they do an epidural or when they do like a spinal, if you're having um, a C-section. This removes all the sensations below the injection site. So you're still awake and you're aware, but you don't feel anything below the injection site. And the way they put the medicine in there is through that subarachnoid space that's around the spinal cord, okay? Now, 
you're not going to go in if you're having a headache and just say, yes, I want some general anesthesia or, hey, give me a spinal. No, you're going to take some pain medication. And that pain medications are known as analgesias or analgesics. These are going to decrease or block the sensation of pain. And they work in different ways. Like Motrin works different than Advil. Advil works different than Tylenol. Okay. Now, some of them are going to block the production of those chemicals that stimulate the sensory neuron, the pain neuron. Those are called the prostaglandins, so it stops them from producing them. So the nociceptors, the pain receptors, never send the signal. Okay. Others can block the impulse conduction down the nerve. The receptor got the signal, but when it sent it to the brain or to the spinal cord, we blocked it before it got there. We intercepted the message so it does not get to go all the way to the spinal cord or brain. Or we can actually have a medication that changes the perception of the pain in your brain. It changes how your brain processes or perceives the pain. And so because of that, you're not feeling that. Now, those are going to be more of your higher narcotics. So you have to be careful with those because they're also very addictive in how they change the chemistry of the brain and make someone feel. But these are all different ways that we can use painkillers. All right, so this finishes up the kind of introduction and the general sensations. In the next part, we're going to get into the special senses. We'll mostly talk in the special senses, probably about vision. No, sorry probably about uh, taste, uh, smell, and hearing together, and then eyes kind of on its own because it's kind of a little bit more difficult to understand. It's more complex, all right? But this gives you an introduction. In lab, you're going to be dealing with a lot of this stuff for the general sensations. You're going to be doing two-point discrimination. When is it with your eyes closed? Can you feel two points touching you instead of one? And we're going to test things like your fingertips, your cheek, your forearm, your leg, okay, that kind of thing. All right. Um, we're also going to test your temperature receptors with warm water, cold water, and room temperature water. Pressure with pennies, where you're going to lay pennies on your, on your hand, and you're going to see when you stop feeling that pressure. And then last, we're going to look at some referred pain. You're going to put your elbow in some ice water and see what happens. Okay, there should be some referred pain that comes with that. So this lab has a lot of hands-on using those sensations and figuring out kind of how they work. We're also going to see in the special senses lab where we're going to look at touch, uh, not touch, but um, smell, uh, taste, hearing, and vision as well. All right, so if you have any questions, if you have any concerns as you're going through this first part, please let me know.